three witnesses. And what we want to look at this morning is three witnesses that are not the common ones that are referred to in this popular passage in 1 John 5, 7, where it talks about three that bear record. You know that verse, and people use that to prove the Trinity. We're going to look at three human witnesses today, and we're going to look at their united testimony and their united witness, and in particular, in relation to where that witness is recorded and where it appears. And we're going to be spending a fair bit of time in the Gospel of John this morning. And in looking at the Gospel of John, I want to just uh, refresh our minds with a few unique features about the Gospel of John. Uh, the Gospel of John is very unique in that it is very different to the other three Gospels that are known as the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they're the Synoptic Gospels in that they give this uh, perspective uh, narrating the life of Christ, his miracles, his teachings, his, uh, his visits, uh, in a very similar way. Sometimes they repeat the same stories in, in almost identical uh, words, but not so with the Gospel of John. If you read the Gospel of John, you will quickly realize it stands apart. It is very different. It's not even referred to as a synoptic gospel. It's a very unique gospel. And there is a reason why it is unique. We're going to be spending some time looking at why it is unique, and we'll look at these three witnesses that we're going to examine together today. But John's gospel is referred to as, as the spiritual gospel. It's a favorite among many. I know it's one of my favorites, and, and for many people, somehow the gospel of John speaks to, to the reader in a way and reveals Christ in a way that truly is outstanding. And there is a reason and there is a purpose for that, that the author of the gospel actually had in mind, which, like I said, we will be examining. Uh, even though it stands apart and it's very different, its message is not uh, you know, contradictory to any of the other Gospels, but it does put a specific focus on Christ that is unique. Now, in order to understand and appreciate the point and the purpose and the way that John's Gospel is written so differently, all we have to do is consult the author of the Gospel, of John, and see what was his point, what was his purpose, what was he trying to accomplish in writing his Gospel. And he actually tells us very plainly at the conclusion of his Gospel. So uh, we'll go to uh, John chapter 20. And we'll look at the conclusion of the gospel and see what we can learn about the purpose behind the writing of this particular gospel. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And he says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. I want us to ponder that here for a minute. This is the purpose of the writing of the Gospel of John. Not just the signs, but all the things that are written in the book are for a particular purpose. This twofold purpose, we're going to look at the primary one, the first one of them today. The twofold purpose is this, that the reader might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's point number one. And then point number two flows out from that one, is that believing you might have eternal life through his name. So it's really one purpose. The purpose is that we might have life. Well, what are the steps to having life? Step number one, believe that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that believing that you might receive him and thereby receive life. So I want to look at the first point here and spend some time looking at that together today. Because like I said, this is what makes the gospel of John stand apart. This is what makes the gospel of John extremely unique and different when it comes to looking at it in comparison with the other Gospels. So the purpose is to record for us enough evidence, enough information, so that he can prove and establish clearly that Christ is indeed the Son of God. Now, uh, of course, the purpose uh, is not just unique to John, I should mention. That's the purpose of all the other Gospels as well. That's actually the purpose of the whole New Testament. That's the purpose of the whole Scriptures. But John takes this burden upon himself to specifically cater and focus his book to prove this particular point. And so John is very selective in what he records in his gospel. And everything in it is actually designed to establish and prove this particular point that we just read. I want us to keep this point in mind because the gospel of John has many passages that are often misunderstood and misapplied because the point and the purpose of the author is missed. If you keep this point and purpose of the author in your mind, as you read the Gospel of John, you will not arrive at a strange conclusion or a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of some of the passages that are commonly misunderstood and misinterpreted. So this is what we want to look at uh, today, like I said, and look at some passages that are commonly misunderstood and misinterpreted. But now, hopefully, with this purpose in mind, it will be a lot easier and clearer to understand. 
This purpose of John is actually demonstrated very clearly in a very powerful threefold way at the beginning of his gospel. The beginning of his gospel is chapter one. We're going to be spending some time in chapter one of John. And he lays there a threefold case to prove this point that he tells us about in his conclusion that he had in mind when he recorded his gospel. When you put those components together, it actually paints a very profound, very powerful picture. And uh, I want us to imagine ourselves in a sense, like in a courtroom, okay? And you are the jury, you and me, we are the jury. And before us is a case about Jesus Christ. And in this case, the question is the following. Is Jesus really the Son of God or not? This is the trial today. This is the case before us. And in this case, we're going to have a number of witnesses. We're going to look at three specific ones uh, that John is going to, to call forward. And one of them is John himself, actually. And these witnesses are going to give their testimony. They're going to give their witness so that we, the jury, can actually decide what is the truth as far as this particular case is concerned. That's just a little bit of a mental image to keep in mind as we go through our investigation, through our study uh, this morning. Because on the one side of the case, uh, you know, the, the opposing side of the case, uh, the side that has all the lawyers and all the educated, uh, you know, lawyers defending the counter argument, and that's the idea of the Trinity, basically, that says that, no, Christ is not really the true and real Son of God. That's not literal. It's actually a metaphor. It's actually a figure of speech. It's only maybe a prophetic type of title. It's only in the context of the incarnation, but it's not really applicable to him in his pre-incarnation pre as a true and literal Son of God. That's the counter argument. That's the opposition. So, uh, this is the two sides. So we're going to look at what John has to say about this. We're going to look at the witnesses that John calls. And we're going to decide as the jury, based on the testimony and the witness of these, uh, the evidence of these witnesses that will come forward, what the truth of the matter is. So he's writing his gospel here to make a case that Christ is the Son of God. And now he begins to call these witnesses. Like I said, there's three of them. The first one is John himself. He's writing the book. He's authoring the book. So the verses that are recorded of what he's writing when he's not recording what someone else said is his witness, is his testimony. And we'll start at the very beginning, John chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, let's put that on the screen and uh, pick up now this uh, interesting passage, John 1 and verse 1. And notice what it says here, familiar passage to many. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, like I said, this is the most, uh, probably the most misunderstood passage in John. And the way it's misunderstood is that it is used in a way to prove the very opposite of John's point. What I mean by that is this. This passage is often quoted to prove that Jesus is God in the sense that he is divine. Uh, so he is God just like the Father. He is God the Son. In the Trinity, there's three of them, one, two, three. And this is the verse that proves that uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt in a lot of people's minds. Is this really what John is concerned with? Is, he what is, is this what he's saying? I don't want to spend too much time on this verse, but I want us to keep in mind something. John is recording the commencement of his gospel he already told us in his conclusion what he has in mind when he begins to write the gospel. And what he has in mind is to prove something, is to prove to us that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. So you can't take any verse in John and prove the opposite of the point that John has in mind when he was writing this. In other words, whatever you do with this verse, you can't come to the conclusion that Christ must not be the Son of God. That's the point here. So what does it mean? What, does, what, is, what is John actually saying when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God? That's the part that people focus on. What does it mean when it says the Word was God? Very simply, it means the Word was divine. It means that Christ, who was with God from the beginning, had the same nature as his Father. And that's what some Bible translations actually say, that he had the God nature. He was just like his Father. It's describing the nature of the Word. It's interesting that the benchmark here is God the Father. The Word was with God, in the beginning with God, and what God was, the Word was. That's actually the, the literal translation of the Greek, how the Greek uh, language there in that verse is 
actually says, what God was, the Word was. In other words, the benchmark is God the Father. And Christ was just like his Father, even to the point of possessing the very nature of God, which happens to be the God nature. So he was with God, and therefore he is what God is. He is God by nature. That's John's point, because he's trying to establish that Christ is the Son of God, as we shall see. Meaning that his sonship is what qualified him to be just like his father. Because elsewhere, you know, the Bible tells us that Christ is the express image of God. He's the express image of his person. He's all the brightness of his glory, and he's the express image of his person. Express image means just like him, exactly like him. So he, is that, so he has the exact same nature as his father, which happens to be the God nature. That's what John is pointing out here. In other words, he's saying what we're dealing with here is that Christ is divine. He's in the category of divine being. He's not dealing with the Trinity. He's not dealing with the makeup of God or who God is. He actually established who the benchmark is. Christ was in the beginning with God, and he was like God. I'm going to see that this likeness actually has much to do with the point that John has in mind. That is, that he is the Son of God. Now, uh, like I said, some people use this passage or misuse this passage to try and prove that Jesus is God in and of himself, independent of the Father. That's usually how this verse is used, as far as the Trinity argument. Trying to use this verse says Jesus is God in that he is God in and of himself, independent of the Father. And this is where this actually contradicts the point of John's gospel and the writing of the gospel. He wrote the gospel. He wrote verse 1 of his chapter with the same purpose in mind, so that you might believe, you and I, the readers, might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So when John writes, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he wants you to understand his point being, he is proving that Christ is the Son of God. And therefore, if he's the Son of God, he naturally has the very same nature as his Father, the very same makeup as his Father, the very same nature is the very same God nature. That's the point, very clear when we put that all together. I'm just uh, presenting John's case here to the jury, so to speak. We are, we are the jury. So, in other words, he starts at the very beginning, at the very, very beginning, even before creation. That's why John 1.1 1 .1 begins the way it does. And to show, his point simply is to show that the sonship of Christ to God is not just about the incarnation. That's, a, that's another uh, key factor here I want us to keep in mind. John begins his gospel at the very beginning, where Christ was with God from the very beginning, to show that the sonship of Christ is not about the incarnation, what happened here on earth. It's something that precedes that. It's, it's something that is from the very beginning. This was the case from the very beginning, from the time when Christ was with the Father. The divine nature of Christ, in that he is God, he is referred to here as God, as possessing the divine nature, is not to confuse the identity of the Father and the Son, is not to merge the identity of the Father and the Son or to come up with this composite, is actually to show that Christ's divine nature, his sonship, predates and pre-exists his incarnation. So, which was first of the two? His divinity or his sonship? Of course, it's his sonship because that's what gives him his nature. It's kind of like, is your humanity or your birth to human parents first? Well, you inherited your human nature when you were born to your parents or when you were formed, whatever it is. But the point is when you're born, the, uh, what, the nature you have is because you were born to earthly parents. And God set that up at the beginning uh, in creation when he made the principle and the rule of like begetting like. Like begets like. The fact that you are born into a human family is the greatest evidence of your humanity. We don't have to wait to see how you act or how you talk or how you behave. We already know by looking at your parents what nature you have. Your, your inheritance is what determines that. In like manner, John is beginning at the very start to show that Christ is divine because that is the nature he inherited from God, his Father. He's proving to you and me that Christ, therefore, is the Son of God. This is an evidence, a demonstration of his sonship. And we'll see that as we go along, hopefully. But uh, that's just the point here. According to John, even his first verse, his first words in the gospel are a proof of the sonship of Christ. That's his conclusion. That's why he wrote it. And this is the very first words he penned with that 
in mind. Now, to be sure of this, notice just a few verses later how he spells it out plainly, just to be sure that we're making the right conclusion about John chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, let's keep reading. Uh, we'll go to our next verse. And this is in verse 14, just a few verses later. And in verse 14, he says the following familiar words as well. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I want us to just think about this verse as well. It's really good to read the verses, to think, to ponder at what the words that are recorded actually relating to us. John actually here shows what he means when he talks about Christ as the Son of God. He refers to him as the only begotten of the Father. This is what he means when he talks about the Sonship of Christ. Now, before we go any further, I want to keep in mind something here, because like I said at the beginning, today we're calling forth three witnesses, right? This is the title of our study, Three Witnesses. John here says, we beheld his glory. He includes himself. He says, this is something that I have seen. In other words, he is relating what he has seen as a witness. This is his testimony. This is his witness. And he's telling us what he saw. So he is, this is why I said he is witness number one. He's telling us what he saw. And what he saw was the glory of Christ as of the only begotten of the Father. And so he took his pen to, to the paper and he decided that he would write his whole gospel to prove this very point that he was an eyewitness of. And so he begins his gospel at the very beginning to show what, where and when that sonship actually commenced. It was at the very beginning with God before creation. And then now in verse 14, he shows us what he means by that sonship. When he says son of God, what he means is he doesn't mean a metaphor. He doesn't mean a role play. He doesn't mean a prophetic title. He doesn't mean the incarnation. He actually means something that he spells out. He says it, the only begotten of the father. So that's John's way of expressing son of God in a more fuller, detailed way. He actually doesn't just say the phrase. He actually tells us how that sonship came to be, that Christ was the only begotten of the Father. He beheld that glory. He saw it. He was an eyewitness of it. And he is recording uh, that very fact for us. Now, this how component is very important because today so many people actually, uh, to, today so many people try and describe or define what Son of God means. And they say, well, it means this, or it means that, or it means the other thing. Here is how John describes it. Here is what it meant to John. Here is, according to John, how Christ is the Son. He was the only begotten. In other words, he wants us to see and get the point that Christ's sonship is a real sonship. It's not a make-believe. It's not a metaphor. It's not any of these things that a lot of people say. It's a real sonship in that he was begotten of the Father. And if you look at the word uh, begotten, you look at the meaning of the word begotten, you actually find that it means only born. I'm not going to go into the details of trying to prove that today, but that's a nice, easy task to, to figure out. It's nice, easy homework that you can do for yourself. And we have some videos about that too anyway. So Christ belongs to the Father. He's the only begotten of the Father, and therefore he is the real Son of God. He's the begotten of the Father. That's why I'm saying he belongs to the Father. And so when John is referring in the beginning, when he says the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, he's referring to the Word who was with God as the begotten of God. I want to I wanna read that to you in a minute in a way that hopefully will, will make it all fit and see his point. Because this is what the whole point of his gospel is. You can't miss that point. Uh, John is not here just referring to the incarnation, as a lot of people imagine. And I'll tell you why. Because that's what someone will say. Someone will say, well, you know, look, this is just the incarnation. You know, when Christ was born on earth, yeah, he was the begotten of God. Yeah, that's, that's what John's talking about. No, because he refers to Christ here as the Word. Why does he refer to Christ in verse 14 as the Word? Because he wants to link this with what he started writing at the beginning of the gospel in verse 1, where he says, in the beginning was the Word. And now here in verse 14, he says, the word was made flesh. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father. In other words, the word is the only begotten of the father. The word was with God in the beginning. He's not referring to the incarnation. He's referring to a beginning much earlier where the word was and where that word was, was as the only begotten of the father. That's, that's to link all the verses together. Because this is his point in writing the gospel. He wants us to believe in the sonship of Christ. He wants us to believe that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. And guess what? His sonship to God did not begin on earth when he was born in Bethlehem. 
his sonship to God actually began way before at the very beginning. This is why John records his verse or reference to, the, to Christ in those particular words. Now, let me put, like I said, let me link all that for you so that we can see it together as to why John is referring to Christ as the word. He links it with verse 1. So verse 1 and verse 14 go together. The beginning was the word. The word was made flesh. He was the only begotten of the Father. Not just when he was made flesh, but when he existed as the word in the beginning. Now, if we look, all of that to, uh, if we look at all of that together, uh, let me put this verse for you. And this is a combination of John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14, combining them together. And hopefully this will make a lot more sense. Explained by John himself. Here's what it says. In the beginning was the word, that is, the only begotten of the Father. And the word was with God, that's his Father. And the word was God, in that he was just like his Father. Does that make sense? That's John 1.1 1, 1 explained by John 1.14. And it's explained in harmony with John's purpose and point of writing his gospel so that you and I might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what he means by Son of God is that he was the only begotten of the Father, and he was begotten of the Father, not just when he was born on earth, but all the way from the beginning when he existed as the Word with God, he was the only begotten of God. Okay, we put all this stuff together from John's three verses here. The verse from the conclusion, John 1.1 1, 1, and John 1.14. I hope that makes sense because this is only witness number one. Uh, there are another two witnesses that will just help confirm this particular point very clearly. Uh, but before we go to the other witnesses, I want to just refer to a parallel passage. And this parallel passage has a significant point that hopefully uh, we will appreciate as we look at it together. It's in Proverbs 8. You're familiar with Proverbs 8, I'm sure. I, I'm familiar. I thought I was very familiar with Proverbs 8. But then something else stood out to me and jumped out at me from Proverbs 8 that I had never noticed before. So I want to share it with you. Uh, let me put it on the screen just to refresh in our minds what it is. But notice this parallel. The same truth is now recorded by the wisest man, by Solomon, uh, relating to the same thing. And this is what John would have had in mind when he records his introduction to the gospel. But let's read this passage, John, uh, Proverbs sorry, 8, verses 22 down to 25. It says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Simply put, Christ here is speaking under the title of wisdom. And he's speaking of a time when he was possessed of God. Or in other words, when he was acquired. When he says, the Lord possessed me, it means the Lord acquired me or got me or obtained me. And he says, it refers to this time as the beginning of his way. Twice, uh, in verse 22 and in verse 23, it says, from the beginning. Interesting that in John 1.1, 1, 1, it talks about, in the beginning was the word. So this is actually the same beginning. This is the same beginning where the word was with God, where God obtained or acquired someone, the word. And the how of it, according to John 1.14, is that he was, only, he was the only begotten of the Father. According to Proverbs here, it says he was brought forth. Twice he says it. Once in verse 24 and once in verse 25. He was brought forth in the beginning with the Father or of the Father. John 1.14 says that. So this is a parallel passage saying the same thing. Talking about the same beginning, the same point. It is pre-creation. Uh, before the creation of, earth, of anything. But I want to I wanna be specific here about a, a particular point that is uh, such a common uh, misunderstanding that we are often uh, accused of, for want of a better word. Uh, we're often said to believe that Christ is a created being. Uh, this is how what we believe biblically is actually misrepresented. Now that's far from the truth. Christ is not a created being. And this passage actually tells us that, as we shall see. But the beginning of God's way, in verse 22, it says here, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. In other words, this is saying, before God did anything, before anything was ever done by God, he possessed me, he acquired me. Uh, I want you to think about that for a minute. What that simply says is that God begetting a son, God acquiring or possessing a son, who was brought forth of him, is not considered a work of God. 
Okay, I want you to think about that. Because it says here that God possessed me, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of all. So God had a son before he did anything, before he created anything, which demonstrates that him having a son was not a work that he did, was not part of creation. You see the point? Right there in Proverbs chapter 8. It makes it very clear that Christ being brought forth of the Father, how the Father acquired him, was before God did any work. So therefore, the birth of Christ was not a work of God. It was not part of creation. It's not classified as God doing something that is uh, recorded as being work. The sonship of Christ to the Father is not a work that God carried out. It's not a process of creation. It's not part of creation, which later on is referred to as the work of God, which we see in the verse, if we keep going, because it says here, this was in the beginning or ever, then it, that means before the earth was. Uh, from everlasting as well. The three reference, there are three markers here in verse 23. It says, uh, Christ speaking, says, I was set up from everlasting. Set up here means anointed. From everlasting, from the beginning, before the earth was. Three reference points to show you that all this happened before creation occurred, which he refers to in verse 22 as the work of God, before God's works of all. So Christ being begotten of God was that beginning. This is what John has in mind, and he records it so that you and I might believe that Christ is the Son of God, and he's the Son of God in that he was begotten of the Father, and when he was begotten of the Father was before God did anything, which means that him being begotten of the Father is not a work of creation, it's not a work of God, it cannot be classed in the same category as creation. It's separate, it's distinct. That's as far as the Bible evidence. Now that, that stood out to me because I had not seen that connection before. But when you put it together with John, you start to see a beautiful, consistent, harmonious picture develop and emerge. And so Christ was brought forth of the Father. He's the only begotten of the Father, as John says. And it's, it's that, at that point, of course, that he was set up or that he was anointed. It's the same point that God acquired him. He was set up when he was, or he was anointed, when he was acquired of God, in other words, when he was brought forth of God, before God did anything. So the fact that God had a son is not a doing thing. You can use that verse to demonstrate to people next time they tell you, well, you're saying Christ is created, that means he was made. Uh, if he was born, that means he was made. That's creation, that's, that's the same as the other thing. No, 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 not according to the Bible. Biblical, clear biblical evidence that creation and the birth of Christ are not the same category. They are not the same thing. One is the work of God. One is before the work of God. Clear enough. I think you get the point. I don't want to harp on it, but I think it's such a beautiful uh, emphasis that the Bible makes here. So this is the connection between John and between Proverbs. Now we're just kind of took a sidetrack just a little bit here to look at Proverbs, to see the parallel, to see that John, what John records is really more details of the same event. What Proverbs says, Christ was brought forth. In the beginning, John says, uh, the word was the only begotten of the Father in the beginning as well. So we're talking about the same beginning. We're talking about something that predates uh, creation. This is how old the sonship of Christ is. This is the beginning. This is the origin, or this is the commencement of the sonship of Christ. It did not commence at Bethlehem. It did not commence at the incarnations, a lot of people uh, imagine. It actually is a lot more ancient than that. It's from the days of eternity. That's a very, very long time ago, long before the creation ever happened. So this is the witness of John. We said this is our first witness. This is John's witness, parallel here with Solomon, of course, that Christ's sonship is all the way in the beginning. And this is why he starts his gospel this way. He's starting his gospel to prove to you and me this divine sonship of Christ. That's what makes him divine. It's his sonship that makes him divine. It's his sonship that makes him God or that makes him just like God in possessing the same God nature, not a lesser nature, not a lower nature, the same God nature. That's why he refers to him as God because he was in the beginning with God. He was begotten of God. This, these are the, the, the pieces of the puzzle when you put them together. Now let's look at witness number two because uh, our court time is limited uh, in this trial and we want to make sure we get all the witnesses up on the stand so they can testify so that we can make this decision. Witness number two in this lineup is also John but this time not John uh, the apostle, this time it's John the Baptist. John the Baptist also witnesses and testifies to the same truth. That's why John records it in his gospel in the very commencement of his gospel in chapter one. Let's look at this verse. It's also in chapter one 
of John, but this time it's verse 15, referring to John the Baptist. It says here, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Pretty straightforward passage we must all be familiar with, but keep in mind that John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. He was older than Christ by six months. He was conceived before him, of course, therefore he was born before him, and the timing in the difference of their birth was approximately six months. Why is this point important? Why am I mentioning this here? Because it will help us understand and appreciate the testimony and the witness of John. Because John here is talking about someone who's coming after him. That's Christ. And he says, this someone who's coming after me is actually preferred before me. And then he gives us the reason why Christ is preferred before John, or that Christ has the preeminence before John. And his point is that the reason why he's preferred before me is for he was before me. In other words, John the Baptist knew that Christ existed before he came to earth. Because remember, John is not now referring to Christ's birth on earth, because that was after John. That was after John's birth in point of time. No, he's referring to the, to exi to the existence of Christ before that point. He says, he was before me. He existed before he came to earth. So, according to John the Baptist, how did Christ exist before he came to earth? How did Christ exist? before him, which gave him the preeminence over John. Well, if we keep reading, we find the answer very clear. Uh, John continues the record, verses 32 down to 34. Notice what we're told. And John bear record. This is why we're saying he's a witness as well, right? He's part of this witness, the group of witnesses. He, bore, he bears record, saying, I saw the Spirit. That's an eyewitness uh, testimony. I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Here is John the Baptist's testimony. I want us to ponder this for a minute again, like I said. John the Baptist said clearly that Christ was preferred before him, uh, was preferred over him because he was before him. Christ existed before John as the Son of God. This is the Son of God which was before me. In other words, when, when he says, he, for he was before me, in other words, he was before me as the Son of God. That's why he is preferred before me, even though he comes after me when he is born on earth. You see the point, very clear. So his sonship, is not, according to John the Baptist now, is not referring to his birth on earth. It's actually referring to what had been Christ's position to begin with, which John the Apostle says, in the beginning was the Word. You see, what John is doing in his gospel is very simple. John gave us the, the reason why he wrote his gospel. He says, listen, I wrote this gospel so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then he begins. He puts the testimony in the beginning, begins at the very beginning to show you how ancient that sonship is. And then he calls forth other witnesses. He tells you, first of all, listen, I, we've seen this word. We, we, we beheld it, you know, uh, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That's my witness. But then he says, well, that's not enough. Let me get another witness. Here, come over here, John the Baptist. Here is John the Baptist. He says he bore a record. And he says Christ was, is preferred before, uh, over him because he was before him. And at the baptism, John the Baptist gives this testimony. He says, this is the Son of God, referring to Christ who existed before him. In other words, the sonship of Christ, according to John the Baptist, is before his incarnation. And this is testimony and witness number two to prove to you and me, the readers the, of John's gospel, that Christ is indeed the only begotten Son of God. Now John here refers to it as Son of God. John the Baptist refers to him as Son of God. John the Apostle explains what that means. This is what he has in mind. So uh, the case is building. <laughs> Hopefully it'll, it'll become uh, rather conclusive uh, as we get to the end or even before we get to the end. Uh, but this testimony of, uh, of John the Baptist, which occurred at the baptism, because if you recall, uh, the baptism story is one of those popular stories that is used also to prove the Trinity. Because they say, well, you see, God was in heaven, Christ was on earth, and the Holy Spirit was there, and, you know, this dove in the middle. And so there is three, there is the Trinity right there. And totally missed the whole point of this story and this testimony. Now, of course, John the Baptist was there. He saw what happened. 
he records what happens. We just read in the verse. Let me put that up again, just to make sure we get the, the details of it. Uh, he records it. He says, I didn't know him. He didn't know Christ. But God told him, the one who sent him to baptize, he gave him this sign. And this sign was, whoever you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So when John saw that, when John heard the voice, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, he bore record, that, therefore, yes, this is the one. This is the son of God who was before me. Now, the one who was speaking here, of course, at the baptism was none other than God the Father. This is the ultimate witness. This is the ultimate witness that you can call to the witness stand. God the Father himself. So case closed. When God the Father rises up to the witness stand and says, listen, this is my beloved son. You know, who's going to argue after that? And what other witnesses do you need after such a witness? But John, the apostle, does not use this ultimate witness in chapter 1. It's kind of referred to in the story of John the Baptist, but he's using, first of all, the witness of men. He's using his own testimony. He's using John the Baptist's testimony to prove this. But I want to look at uh, this point of the baptism. Does the baptism story prove a trinity? In other words, uh, if we were to ask a, a couple of questions and see what Jesus actually said about it, you will find something very, very uh, interesting developed. Uh, who was responsible for the voice at the baptism of Christ? It was God the Father. He said with his own voice, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, his next question is, uh, and you can kind of guess what I'm going to ask, who was responsible for the shape? Because it says in the verse that we just read here, uh, the Spirit descended uh, upon him. In the other Bible accounts, it says in the, in the form of a dove or in the shape of a dove. Who was responsible for that shape? Well, it depends on your understanding of God as to how you answer this. But actually, according to the Bible, it was God the Father who was responsible for that shape. God the Father himself, not someone else. I want to read this to you uh, from the Gospel of John as well. And I want to show, uh, show this verse here. Uh, John... Let me look it up because I actually don't have it here in my notes, but I want to read it to you nonetheless. Uh, and here it is, John chapter 5 and verse 36. Let me put it up on the screen for you, and then you can see it with me. John chapter 5 and verse 36 and 37. Jesus speaking. And notice how he answers these questions that we put for, forth uh, he says, but I have greater witness than that of John, referring to John the Baptist. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. I want you to think about the words of Jesus here, recorded in the Gospel of John, of all places, right? So this is dealing with what we're talking about. So John's recording this to prove to us the same point he has in mind, that Christ is the Son of God. What event is Jesus referring to here when he says in verse 37, the Father bore witness of Christ with a voice and with a shape? There's only one event. That event is the baptism. This is why I asked the question earlier, who was responsible for the voice at the baptism? It was God the Father. Who was responsible for the shape at the baptism? According to Jesus, it was God the Father. According to Jesus, recorded by John, recorded by John the Apostle, who is using the testimony of John the Baptist, who witnessed this event to prove to you and me that Christ is the Son of God, which is exactly the same thing that God the Father testified at the baptism when he gave a voice and when he, God the Father, gave the shape as well. So according to Christ, the voice and the shape belong to God the Father. They are of God the Father. It's not two different persons. It's not two different people, one in heaven and one in midair, testifying about Christ. It is one person. It is the ultimate testimony, the ultimate authority in the whole universe. It is God the Father himself, testifying with a voice and with a shape to the sonship of Christ to himself, recorded by John the Apostle and testified to by John the Baptist, who was there, who tells us, listen, this is the Son of God who was before me. So he's not talking about his birth after him. He says, even though he was after him, no, he was before me. And how he was before me is he was, he is preferred before me because of the fact that he was before me and he is the son of God. The sonship is not dealing with the incarnation. So if you put all these things together, brothers and sisters, the case becomes extremely overwhelming as to what the conclusion of the matter is. This is what God said at the baptism. This is the witness he gave of his son. And Jesus credits his father with both voice and shape. 
John the Apostle is recording that event in his gospel, and he's explaining this event in his gospel to show you and me that this has nothing to do with the Trinity, that this has everything to do with the fact that Christ is the Son of God. So therefore, you can't use this evidence to prove the very opposite of what the author intended when he wrote it. That's to misuse and abuse what he's trying to say. Witness number three, we have some time left for our third witness, so let's call him up. And witness number three is also recorded in John chapter one. It's interesting that before John records any of the signs that Jesus did, does, before he begins to record any of the miracles that Jesus did, he actually begins with laying out the foundation and calls these three witnesses himself, John the Baptist, and number three is actually Nathaniel. Let's read the verse. Nathaniel is not often uh, considered in this particular light or this context, but here it is. It's also in John chapter 1, verses 47 down to 49. This encounter... Jesus, it says, saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no God. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Wow. <laughs> you know, that, that testimony is, in light of what we're finding so far, is absolutely incredible. It's consistent, it's harmonious, it's proving the same thing, and there is a reason why John the Apostle is picking these instances and recording them right there at the foundation, at the commencement and the introduction of his gospel, with the purpose and the point in mind, so that the reader might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He begins at the beginning, he gives his own witness, he, then he gives John the Baptist witness, and now he gives Nathaniel's witness. And lo and behold, Nathaniel actually gives the very same thing, the same witness. He says, you are the Son of God. What does Nathaniel mean by that? He means the very same thing that John is meaning. That's why he's recording it in his gospel. Nathaniel can't all of a sudden, you know, uh, go against the whole consistent testament and say, well, this is just referring to the incarnation. No, he's referring to the supernatural divine revelation that came to his mind as a result of the words of Jesus. Because Jesus told him, listen, before you came, I saw you. What that meant, not to get into the details of the how of that, that's not the point here. The point simply is, this was a supernatural revelation to Nathaniel. He saw there was something supernatural about Christ that goes more and it goes beyond what he could just see physically as a human being. In other words, this human being in front of him that looks like a human, like all the other humans, that behaves and acts like all the other humans, there's actually more to him than all the other humans. And what is more to him, he recognized his divine nature, his divine identity. When, he, when Christ gave to Nathaniel a supernatural revelation, he says, listen, I saw you before that. He said, he realized this is not any normal human being. This must be the one prophesied in the law by Moses and in the prophets, which Nathaniel was familiar with, which Nathaniel understood, which is actually what Philip told him when he went to call him. So Nathaniel had all this in his mind, that he's looking, longing, waiting for the Messiah, the Messiah that was promised by Moses and the prophets, who would be none other than the Son of God. And when he came to Christ, Christ gave him this divine supernatural revelation that convinced him and brought to his attention that who he's dealing with and who he's seeing right now is no mere human being. This is none other than the very Messiah. And how he expressed his faith that this is the Messiah, he didn't say, I believe you are the Messiah. This is a key point to keep in mind. He says, you are the Son of God, which is equivalent and synonymous to the Messiah, which is what John says at the end of his gospel, which we just read the verse earlier, where he says, I wrote all these things so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that is, is the Messiah, the Son of God. So these two terms are synonymous. They go together. Messiah, Son of God. Son of God, Messiah. So when uh, Nathaniel gave this testimony, this witness says, you are the Son of God. He's saying, you are the Messiah. You are that one who was with God from the beginning, who was promised to come to us through Moses and the prophets, and you now arrived here on earth. And now I recognize and see that you are that one, and this is the testimony. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. What does that mean? You are the promised one who will sit on David's throne, who will be the inheritor of the promise to David, who will sit and rule Israel, uh, the King of Israel. The king of Israel has to do with his mission on earth as the son of David, born as the son of man. What, pre, what uh, qualified Christ for that is that he was the son of God. He was with God from the beginning. He's the only one who could come to earth to be the Messiah and to fulfill this plan of salvation. All of this is contained in Nathaniel's testimony when he says, Rabbi, Master, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So consistent testimony from all three. Beautiful, amazing 
powerful introduction to the Gospel of John. Nathaniel stands as witness number three. And this is why John begins his Gospel in this way. He begins his Gospel by giving us eyewitness accounts of human beings, individuals who saw the Messiah, who interacted with the Messiah, who testified to the truth of the identity of the Messiah, and that they saw beyond and past his human garb. That this is not just a reference to his humanity. They're not dealing with the fact that he was born on, in Bethlehem. They're dealing with his true and pre-incarnate identity. They recognize that despite the human garb. And this is the point of John the Apostle in calling forth these witnesses. I find it an, an incredible, neat detail at the introduction to the book of, uh, to the Gospel of John, before he even begins to record any miracle of Jesus. Isn't that incredible? The sonship of Christ is the foundation. And that, by the way, includes John 1.1. 1, 1. So John 1.1 1, 1 is an establishing point for the sonship of Christ, not for a trinity, and not for any doctrine that denies the sonship of Christ, which according to John is being the only begotten of the Father, in harmony with Proverbs, which is being brought forth, that is born, that's a real event. And that's an event that is distinguished from God's work and distinguished from creation, as we saw, just keeping all, all the pieces together in this story. So what's the conclusion of all this? Now, I kind of already gave you the, uh, the, a bonus witness in there that John kind of referred to, but not directly, when we looked at the story of the baptism and when we looked at the fact that God the Father himself testified of his son with his own voice. That kind of closes the case, and you don't need any more witnesses. And here it is from 1 John 5 and verse 9. He says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his son. Here is John writing in his letter, and he's basically saying, listen, there is the witness of men. I've, uh, and in my gospel, I quoted men, plenty of men. I quoted the signs and miracles and works and wonders of Jesus to prove one thing. But there is even a greater witness than all of this. That is the witness of God himself. And the witness of God is what he testified of his son. What did God testify of his son? We already saw that. He testified the same truth. He just testified and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Which is interestingly enough, like I said, referred to in the commencement of the Gospel of John. The story of the baptism is so significant. You know, all the Gospels recorded, including John, he refers to it as far as the context of what John the Baptist's testimony is, and he gives us the meat of it, the conclusion of it, when John the Baptist repeated basically the words of God the Father. This is the Son of God. He says, but look, I gave you the witness of men. The witness of God is even greater. What more do you need? So uh, the jury here, we're presenting a very solid case hopefully, so that the jury can, can look at all the evidence, can hear all the witnesses, and the ultimate witness of all, and come to a right conclusion as to the identity of Christ and the meaning of his sonship. Not just that, yes, he's the son of God, well, we all agree with that, but no, what it means biblically, as far as John is concerned, as we saw. So, to summarize, we kind of, uh, I, I summarized it all for you already, but to summarize, we looked at these key passages, these key verses. John 1, uh, verse 1 and John 1 14 and we looked at them together how that Christ was the word with the father as the only begotten of the father he was with God and he was just like God because he was born of God that's why he has the God nature and is called God he's not called God to make him the God of the Bible or to confuse him with the father or confound him with the father but he's called God in that it identifies that he has the very nature of his father in other words he is the son of God he inherited the father's nature we saw the testimony of John the Baptist. He said the same thing. This is the Son of God. He was before me. We saw the testimony of Nathaniel who said the same thing. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Not just referring to his humanity, but you recognize his Messiahship, which was prophesied all through the Old Testament. Beautiful testimony. Harmonious testimony. Now, uh, here is the, the conclusion of chapter 1 of John, and I find this very beautiful. This is our last verse today. We'll close with this, and this is where it becomes relevant and practical for us as we put all the pieces together. So after this encounter with Nathaniel, John concludes his first chapter in verse 51 by saying, speaking, uh, Jesus is speaking you. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Of course, the story that Jesus here is uh, referencing is none other than the story of Jacob. When he was a runaway, and he had this dream about this ladder connecting heaven with earth. Now I want us to think about this passage here because 
Why does Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man? I've asked myself this question. Why didn't Jesus refer to himself as the Son of God? Because he's, that's, that's kind of in the, in the context. This is, this is what John is occupied with. It's all about the Son of God. But now when Jesus speaks, he refers to, him as the son of man, to himself as the Son of Man. Why is that? Well, the reason is actually very simple. Because he's referencing this ladder. And because this ladder has two connecting, it's connecting two points. The beginning of the ladder is connecting heaven. And the ladder is the connecting point. And the last rung of the ladder is connecting earth. The ladder is not short at the top and it's not short at the bottom. It's complete. If you think about it this way, chapter 1 of John is actually the ladder. Verse 1 of John is, chapter 1 verse 1 is the top rung of the ladder, establishing the divine nature of the word. He is the son of God. He has this intimate connection, knowledge of God. He is with God from the very beginning. He's the only begotten of the Father. That's the top rung of the ladder. Interestingly enough, the last verse in that chapter gives us the lower rung of the ladder where Christ now comes as the Son of Man. And as the Son of Man, He is intimate with us. He's a human like us. He is born in the human family. He's the same person who is at the beginning with God who comes to connect humanity with God. He is both the beginning and the ending. He is the first and the last the top rung and the bottom rung. He is the son of God. He is the son of man. But the son of man is not a different identity. He is still the son of God. He is the same identity. But the reason why Christ identifies himself as the son of man here is because he's saying, I'm coming. I have come down to your level. I have come down to where you are so that I can connect you to myself. And when I connect you to myself, you are therefore automatically connected with God because guess what? I have not ceased to be connected with God. I am still God's son. That is my connection with God. Beautiful picture, beautiful imagery. This is why Christ is referring to this particular story. Now, it's just like, like I, he referred to the story of Jacob. I want to, like I said, I want to make this practical for us because when Christ appeared to Jacob in this dream as the ladder uh, with the angels ascending and descending, uh, at that time, Jacob was running away. He was despondent. He was discouraged. He, he, he basically was kind of giving up. He had deceived his father. He ran away from his brother who wanted to kill him. And he would have felt down, guilty, and, and, and very, very discouraged, very despondent. And Christ appeared to him in this dream to encourage him, to strengthen him. And that dream was so impacting to, J uh, to Jacob that he actually made a pillar stone. He called it Bethel. He says, surely this is the gate of heaven. This, this place is God's dwelling place. And he was encouraged and he went forward and God was with him and blessed him. I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. The truth about the Son of God, the Sonship of Christ, is not a theological position. It is, like it was for Jacob, a practical truth that connects us with God, especially at the time when we are down, when we are out, and we are despondent like Jacob. Christ is the ladder, and Christ, Christ as the ladder, he is both the Son of God at the very beginning, the Son of Man down here at the bottom with us. And he comes to us as the Son of Man to connect us with himself, to lift us back up to God, especially when we are down and out. So if you are feeling like Jacob, you've messed up, you've, you've, bl you've blundered, you've failed, uh, you're discouraged, you're disheartened, you, you, you deceived someone, you lied to someone, you know, people are, whatever it might be, don't give up on yourself. Remember, the truth of the Sonship of Christ is for this very purpose. That's why John records his gospel. He's the, he's the Messiah. He wants us to believe that Christ is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, the Son of God. The Son of God means he seeks to save that which is lost. He has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He has come all the way from the top, all the way to the bottom to meet us where we are. Christ comes and finds us where, you are, where we are, where you are, wherever you might be, fallen by the wayside, discouraged, disheartened, you know, being beaten and kicked by Satan. This is what the truth about the Son of God is. We too often treat it like a theological position and an argument. Well, there's this verse and there's that verse. Here's the practical reality of it, brothers and sisters. The Son of God is the Son of Man for the purpose of being a ladder for you and me personally, a ladder that connects us to heaven. This is, his, he says, you, you will soon see this in evidence, uh, Nathaniel. You will see this in action. And what, how did Christ demonstrate that in action? The rest of the Gospel of John records this, records how Jesus mingled with the down and out and the downtrodden and the sinners and the outcasts, and he healed them, he raised them, he restored them, he forgave them, he, he, he gave them life. This is the whole point of the gospel. He says, listen, let me show you the Son of God in action. Here, do you believe that this is the Son of God now, the one that connects us with heaven? This is the point. So I want to make this practical for you and me, brothers and sisters. Let's not treat this beautiful, amazing, incredible truth as a theological position to just argue over. The Son of God means he is the one who is intimately connected with God. And he's the one that comes to us 
so that we can be intimately connected with him and therefore connected to God. When you break that connection at anywhere, you have broken the ladder. When you say that Christ is not the Son of God, you are removing this connection between him and God, so we now we don't have a connection between heaven and earth, or earth and heaven, whichever way you want to look at it, whichever way you want to start. That's the point of the Sonship of Christ. That's why John begins his gospel at the very beginning. The divine Son of God, and at the end of chapter 1, he shows you this is the Son of Man. Here is the ladder. Here is the testimony of three witnesses, but the testimony of God is greater. Christ comes to lift up the, the discouraged, the weak, the desponding, the dying, the sick, the, 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 all these spiritual maladies above all, not just the physical malady. And he is the Savior of men. This is the Son of God. That's the whole point of the Gospel of John. Beautiful picture, beautiful reminder. I just want to share it with you. I want to encourage you. Don't think of the truths of the Bible just as theological positions. They are real. They are practical. I want to leave you with that beautiful truth about the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior of men, especially men who find themselves in the place of Jacob, like Jacob was. This is how he first appeared to him. This is a, a personal uh, thing that God wants to extend to each one of us personally through his Son to be that ladder. His son is that ladder to connect us with him. So let us keep our eyes on the ladder. Let us remember that the ladder is complete. It has no missing rungs. It goes all the way to the top to where God is because it's his son. And it comes all the way to the bottom to where we are because he came and be, he came to our level. He became one of us, a man who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities so that he's able to succor all those who are in need of help. That's, that's the beautiful picture that John's gospel paints. That's just one chapter, the introduction, but it lays an incredible foundation. I pray that it's something to remember, it's something to, to bless you, it's something that you can take on board and actually take courage from, not just treat as an idea. It's a personal savior. That's what the sonship of Christ really means to us individually and personally. I'll leave it at that. Let's have a word of prayer to close and then we can discuss if we have any questions or comments afterwards. So if you are able to bow your heads with me, let's just have a word of prayer together. Our loving eternal Father, we are so thankful that you have given us such ample evidence in your word of the truth of the identity of your Son, who is fully divine and fully human, who was with you from the beginning, who was born, begotten of you, and who is the one who is most intimate with you, and that you have given him, that divine begotten Son, you have given him to us completely, to be born of a man, to be one of us, to be our Messiah, our Savior, to lift us up and to connect us back with you. We're so thankful for this incredible, amazing Savior. I just pray that you will, as you encourage Jacob in his journey, that you will encourage and uplift each and every one of us, especially those who might be downtrodden, those who might be disheartened, those who might be discouraged, those who might have had a bad week, those who might have been buffeted by Satan and are, are on the verge of giving up, just like Jacob was. I pray that the Son of God will come to them especially and remind them that He is that ladder to connect them back with you that you love us, that you desire and you long and you love to forgive us and to restore us and to uplift us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. We know that and we know how he tries to dishearten us. Help us to look to Christ, to remember that he is the ladder, he is the door, he is the only way between us and heaven. We thank you for such a wonderful Savior and we ask all these things in his mighty and wonderful name, the name of Jesus.